when I was a kid, my dad, my parents got divorced. My dad moved in. This is going to show my age, but my dad moved in next door to the guy that was like the first person to have VHS and VCRs and all that. And every night he would rent three or four movies and copy them. And he was able to, for some reason, broadcast them throughout the neighborhood. And so I stayed up at night at a really young age watching movies that I shouldn't be watching. And that's where it started. And then when I went to undergrad, I was like, no, I can't do movies. I have to do something safe. Like I'd be an accountant or something stupid. And then, uh, and then, during undergrad, I was like, I, I, I didn't have any passion for accounting. I like business, um, but I knew that I wanted to do something, film, TV, something related. So I ended up going to grad school in Chicago um, for film. And then while I was there, I met Meg Lefove, who's now an Oscar-nominated writer, but at the time was a producer. And uh, worked, she ran Jodie Foster's company. And I said, can I come intern for you? And that's kind of the origin of how I got to LA. Like I interned for her and then everybody said, you know, go work in an agency. Like they tell you, right. If you want to be a producer, go work in an agency, work on a lit desk. And so I did that. And then I ended up going to revolution studios, um, which was started by Joe Roth, who had just left running Disney and, uh, and was like this big, big to do, like he had a billion dollars and he had deals with Bruce Willis, Julia Roberts and Adam Sandler, the biggest, stars at the time. And, and I ended up going there to be an assistant right at the ground floor. Um, I got promoted a year later when, when my boss, Todd Garner said to, uh, well, my, the overlord boss, um, said to the bosses above me, Greg Silverman and Derek Douch, he said, um, I need somebody who knows everyone in town and has access to secret scripts and all that shit, which I was that guy. Cause I just knew everybody in town, right. Starting out. And, um, and so that's really the, the beginning of my career as an exec. So I got promoted, oversaw white chicks and worked on tears of the sun. I, as a junior exec, I worked on, um, black Hawk down, uh, I helped out with triple X, you know, just the beginnings of the studio. Then I went to, um, to work for Joel Silver after I was at revolution for four years. And I went to work for Joel Silver, who. I teach at USC now and none of the students know who Joel Silver is, um, which is funny, but um, Joel was like the biggest, one of the biggest producers. He did uh, Lethal Weapon, Die Hard, uh, the Matrix movies. And so I worked there for four years and was largely a producer, um, but we were exclusive to Warner Brothers. So anything that we developed, I had to either sell to them or not. And this was at the time when everything started to become about IP, like everything was about IP. And so I had one shot to sell something and they really only wanted IP. So I went to like, I became friends with the people at Mattel and I sold He-Man and Hot Wheels to Warner Brothers. I worked on remakes of Dirty Dozen um, with Guy Ritchie and Zach Penn wrote a draft. Um, and then I was working on, a uh, oh, of Logan's Run. I was working on a remake of Logan's Run, which is where I gave Joe Kaczynski his first feature job. Um, and then... Well, first development job. And then, um, and then, so I was there for four years and I worked with Guy on Rock and Rolla and then a few other movies. And then went back to being a studio executive at New Regency. And I was at New Regency for almost four years. And that to me, I tell people, is like the, the, the kind of the most insane time in my career. But because I was buying the coolest freaking projects, like I bought Gray Man. Not the version that you saw on Netflix, but I bought Gray Man that we eventually developed and had um, with James Gray directing and Brad Pitt was going to star in like a more grounded, gritty version of it. I, I bought a script for a million dollars, which is a little bit infamous in Hollywood called Medieval, which was like the Dirty Dozen set in Medieval Times, a script that everyone loved. Um, and that's where I first met Chad and Dave, um, who were the 8711 stunt guys who were going to do second unit on our movie and then. They went off to have their careers. Um, and like I, there, I bought a bunch of really cool projects that were that should have all gotten made and then for political reasons or not, didn't. And then at the end of my time there, mostly born out of frustration and also because of a large shift out of features and everybody going into TV, which I was too slow to pick up on, um, I went into the indie world and started. So that was about 10 years ago. Um, and I went to go run an independent company, which was more about not indie art house, but indie like foreign sales driven and independent finance 
um, projects. And the funny story I like to tell is um, when I was running that company upstairs from us was this little company called Netflix, which um, had a few people in the office. And uh, we went and met with Cindy Holland and I, and uh, she said, bring us TV shows. We need TV shows. And I remember turning to my TV executive and this was 10 and a half years ago. I remember turning to my TV executive being like, why would we take a company that mails out DVDs, TV shows? Like, I, I don't understand. And then, and then House of Cards came out a year later. So, and th they, within months, took over the top floor and then they took over the whole building. And then they moved and built all those buildings in Hollywood. So that's kind of been the trajectory. So I've been in the indie space and now running my own company, consulting, half my time or more is taken up by consulting. And I also teach at USC and I'm casting six movies right now. That's a good question. And I, in my class at USC, this is the one thing that I start out telling everyone um, when I started in the business, everyone kind of said, you know, do the traditional, go work in an agency, go work in the lit department, you know, whatever. But I quickly realized that people didn't really know anything. It was more about who they knew. <laughs> and so I, I just, I be, partially because people told me partially out of just picking up on it. I started like when someone would call to talk to my boss, the lit agent at UTA. When someone would call, talk to him, I became friends with that assistant on the phone. I talked, chat them up for a second. And then I took them out and had drinks with them. Every night I had like, a, and I tried to build, like we covered Warner Brothers. So at first it was like one assistant at every one of the production companies on the lot. And then one of the assistants at every, for every executive on the lot. And then it branched out. It was like, okay, now assistants at other studios and other production companies. So I had within the six months I was there, I knew, I knew all the assistants. Like I tell the students, don't try to go meet the president of a studio. That doesn't matter. Go be, go meet the people that are on the ground, ground floor working their way up. And some of those people aren't in the business anymore, but the first person I had drinks with, who's still a very, very good friend of mine, she's the one that told me about the job at revolution, which I ended up getting. Um, and, and they kind of just spider web from there. It was like getting to know, um, you know, assistants, then ex junior execs. And then there was like a dinner that we had. It's funny now looking back, there was a dinner we had when I was a junior executive where it was like one guy from every studio went and all of the guys that we had dinner with are now eventually all of them ran studios except me. I was like high up at one, but they all ran. It was like Jeff Kirschenbaum and um, Tobin Armbrust, like all these guys that eventually went and ran a, a studio. Um, Dan Lin, like those guys all came to that dinner. This is generalization, but there's kind of two types of people in this business. There's the ones that are social butterflies. And there's the very internal facing people. There's a lot of them who are internal facing, but really, really good at story and really have a good sense of, you know, how to tell a story and whatever. And, and, um, I think the best people in the business are like the, the ones that do really well, are the ones that kind of have a little bit of both. Um, but you know, there's there, now there's all types in the business, but that's kind of, how I was. I went from, this is, this is another thing I tell students. Um, I went from being the guy that was the yes or no guy and to being the guy that had to sell and only sell at one place, which was a backwards way of doing it. It was a terrible, like not, it wasn't like it was a career choice, but it was a terrible a path because I literally would just read scripts as a studio executive and be like, ah, I guess, I don't know. Yeah. Like I didn't have any basis upon which to make these kind of decisions yet versus going to be a, a, um, a seller where you only have one place to take it. And it's like, dude, you really have to zero in on what makes a great story. And you're not saying yes or no to things. You're really t finding things that you're super passionate about, have commercial viability and know that it's the kind of thing the buyer wants and you, you know, finding talent and all that stuff that a producer has to do to put it together in a way to make it something that a buyer wants. Um, that's what I think. And I think that's what people should start out doing, like learning how to sell. And frankly, that's what um, the assistants at Warner Brothers at the time, I don't, I don't know if they do this anymore, but at the time, the assistants at Warner Brothers were, had to go, they couldn't get promoted internally. You had to go work at a production company first and then come back. Joel, became a financier when he got a film fund to do the dark castle movies, which is where I made rock and roll. And those went usually went through Warner brothers. Um, but Joe Roth at, in revolution, they were financier. So they just had a, they just had an output deal deal domestically at Sony, but they had output deals all around the world at different places. Yes. It changed all the time. Um, I, I, I guess I could tell this story. Um, 
when when I was, I don't think I'd even been promoted yet, or maybe I'd just been promoted. Our first movie was Tomcats. And Tomcats, which was not a very good movie, but was a reaction to the American Pie movies. It was Joe saying, hey, those movies work. Let's do that. If you're reacting to something, it's usually probably a little bit too late anyways. But um, the d- doing Tomcats w- felt a little too late, right? And then the weekend it came out, I'll never forget, the, the weekend it came out, he went, okay, no more R-rated teen comedy, whatever. Now we're going to do director-driven, star-driven fare, and we're doing this movie next. And he threw down the script to Geely, which was, you know, at the time, a colossal disaster. Um, I, But I think the interesting thing about that time was also right around that time, Joe could have invested on on Spider-Man at Sony and didn't. And no one really knew what IP, how big it was going to become. And at that point, the movies that were getting made were, hey, think of a really good, we used to call them TV guide concept ideas, you know, where it was like this one or two line blurb of like, uh, hey, here's Eddie Murphy loses his job and starts a daycare for kids daddy daycare right it was like a great one line blurb and it had a movie star attached go make that right that's how that's how movies were made um at, that movie got greenlit and they hadn't even read the script yet because it was just eddie was available and there were, there was a script and it was a great idea um so that kind of thinking and filmmaking obviously changed and you know certain genres weren't work you know there was a time when There was a time in the 80s and 90s when like the cop thrillers that Paramount made were like the thing, you know, Kiss the Girls and Along Came a Spider. Um, And that went away partially because TV was doing it, doing it well. But things and and at that time, I said, man, if TV ever figures out how to do visual effects cheaply, they're going to take over fantasy and science fiction, too. Right. And um, and and they have. And the the is in like rom-coms went away for a long time theatrically but now they're back because of streamers you can sit home watching them so i the the mandates and things shift they shift with what the audience wants they shifted with the demand for ip but i would argue that the one thing that's remained consistent whether or not the you know demand for certain genres change was that they, everybody always wants a good story. Everybody still wants a great high concept thing with a movie star, whether it's IP or not. Everybody still wants, well, Netflix still wants a great romantic comedy that's high concept and fun, right? Like all those, they're, they're, they're still in demand. They don't have to be IP driven, even though IP is still in demand, but they still want great storytelling, right? Most of the scripts that I'm casting, now, I just got an email from one of the heads of CAA who we sent her a script is a really high concept, fun action comedy set around the holidays. And she loved it. And she's sending it to the talent, the actor that we went out to. Um, because if you operate from that place of like, okay, this is a genre that works that people want, but what's a great high concept and like, and execute it really well. Like the, it, you can, I mean, it's really, really hard to cast right now. It's because all the actors are in demand, but you can get, get stuff made. It was, yeah, it was a perfect storm. I thought I was really, really cool that during COVID I sold like 15, 16 things, you know, and put so many things together, but so did everybody else. And, um, and yes, COVID ended, but the streamers have re like, I always point to Oscar Isaac as an example. Oscar Isaac last year was on three different streaming things, right? Like a Marvel thing and the the mar- marriage stories or whatever. Like he's he's in so many different things and that's just streamers. And they and the streamers are paying a lot for actors too. So it's like I can take a few months and go do this for a lot of money at a streamer or this movie over here for a lot of money at a studio. Um so the little guys are getting are ha- having a really hard time because it's like, well, these actors are like, eh, I mean, that that mentality of like, I can stay home with my kids or I can wait and go do this other thing at the streamer. Like the thinking has changed a lot. It's not like this frantic thing to get one of, you know, the 50 actors that are out there available and popular on these 10 movies getting made. Now there's a million things getting made at different places. So it's just really hard to cast. I'll, I'll say this with a caveat. I don't really develop pitches that much anymore. If I develop pitches... It's with the idea that I'm going to get a script out of it before I take it out. Meaning I'm not, I I just can't as much in the business. I don't have the time to, to develop a pitch and 
And then unless it's based on a piece of IP that I control, I can't take out a pitch and take that out to buyers and take months developing it and blah, blah, blah. It's just, it's a colossal waste of time. Most of the stuff I do, sometimes they start from pitches, but it's with the understanding with a writer that like, okay, but you're going to write this, <laughs> right? And I'm not paying you to write it. I'll help you develop it. And, and, um, and I've actually had a lot of success lately from that. Um, the one that CA liked um, is, I, I can tell you this, um, is my buddy and I, Eric, we're working on this idea of um, how do we take like Christmas vacation and make it an action comedy? Like how do we take the family dynamics that are on the holidays but have bad guys attack a house? And the idea being like, okay, we're going to keep it contained. We're going to try to keep the budget down, have all the fun with a crazy family. And then do an action comedy. And we came up with this idea for it. Like guy comes, Seth Rogen type guy comes home for the holidays. Mom has a new boyfriend he didn't know about, and it's Liam Neeson, right? He outs Liam Neeson, who turns out to have been a spy in hiding, and bad guys show up. It's like that kind of idea, really fun idea. Um, Eric, we were going out to find a writer to do that idea. And, and we knew that was like, like a really good idea. Eric sent me 25 pages one day and said his buddy wrote this 25 pages, and I or read it, and it was awesome. And it turns out he wrote it and he ended up getting paid by somebody to finish the script. Um, and then we had another one, not with him, but another writer friend of mine that we were developing as a straight up action movie about a guy trying to get out of Area 51 who was, who was an alien, like, but in human form. And we were developing that as an action idea. And then the writer one day was like, this isn't working. It's, you know, trying to do the raid is too hard. And he developed as an action comedy with a great hook in it, um, which I shouldn't say, but it has like this great hook this great twist in it that nobody's ever done and it's a lot of fun and that idea he they ended up writing it and we just sold it or in the process of selling it so pitching today has a context but most places i can't take a pitch especially in features tv is different but i can't take a pitch in features out to market right now and sell it unless i have like big movie star attached or big ip behind it or big even with a director it's hard yeah. 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 The, the, okay. So that's a great question because there's been times in my life where I have a pet peeve where someone spends an hour pitching me something and they're like, and I have the script. I'm like, well, why didn't you just tell me I have the script? Right. That that's annoying, but getting me excited about the idea and pitching me the idea. So when I pitch you the action comedy center on the holidays, and tell you, you know, Seth Rogen type guy comes home and mom's dating Liam Neeson. Like you immediately in your head. And it's like Christmas vacation because it's all the family dynamics. I tell you that, you know exactly what that movie is, right? At that point, I go, oh, you know, this is how I think. I go, oh, you know what? I know a million different places that would do that movie if it's executed right. Then it's about the execution, right? So you pitch me like the quick version of it and I read it and make sure that it's good. My old boss at Revolution, um, Todd, used to stop people in pitches because he's like, yeah, 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 I know how it's going to end. Tell me about the characters. Tell me about the like theme or something, right? Like, every, like everybody knows how the story is probably going to go. And he would say, tell me something else, right? And, and it's, and it's kind of like that. Was, if you have a script written, it's like, okay, tell me what makes it different that I'm going to want to read it. I think if people make a good comedy, people go see it. The problem is, A, American comedy doesn't tend to travel. Right. So a lot of places don't necessarily want to make it. I mean, could you imagine your Netflix and you're like, I have a growing market in India and I have a growing market in like all these other countries where they don't get our sense of humor. They don't get our language. I wouldn't make a comedy. Right. If I'm if I'm trying to make something globally appealing, I wouldn't make a straight up comedy. Um, and in the theater business is taking a couple gut punches right now. So it's it's hard to even imagine d developing a comedy for theater but yeah i mean st some streamers are still making them tv's doing it really well um there's so much stuff on tv that's funny as hell like you know why am i gonna go i i think there's a place for comedies mostly action comedies to be honest because you want the spectacle and the fun the other forms of fun in it and action comedies travel um but comedies get made there and there's a bunch of them still getting made um like vac vacation friends and like movies like that that have done pretty well um but it has to be the right thing it has to be the right kind of casting it has to have a great concept behind it um and it's seeing people in things that you didn't expect them to like john cena doing it you know like things like that that i think are make financiers get excited by it for one thing 
Streamers have completely changed the shape of the business. The finance model around making something is completely different. Um, I mean, unfortunately, writers and producers, anybody who previously used to see a back end doesn't really see them anymore. Um, and, and so then it's about like, okay, how can we make something? So then it's like, okay, well, can you make it cheaper? Right. And I think the, whether you call it the volume or whatever, like that's changed the shape of how movies and TV shows are getting made. You know, I'm talking about the big screens. Um, cause it gets rid of green screens and o over overwrought visual effects and like all that kind of stuff. So that's one way that's changed the face of how stuff's getting made. Um, I'm develop. I think I can say this. I'm developing a reboot of tremors at universal. And we met with, um, a director who has a studio and a large volumetric screen, whatever you want to call it. And, um, and he, w I was like, you can't do that. You can't do creatures jumping out of the and he was like no you can't but here's a lot of other things that you can do right and then you're like when you're looking at making something and rebooting it doing it cheap then you're like oh that's actually interesting right so like that's one example um i think another big big shift recently has been um people of color and lbgtq you know like the 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 business has completely shifted away from middle-aged white dudes like me uh, creating as much content, I think in a good way, because there's so much more stories to be told and so many different stories out there um, that uh, are being done now. And even like, whether it's comedy and you like, could you imagine uh, um, what, uh, what's the show uh, about the, Middle Eastern guy, and um, it's a comedy. That with sorry. Well, that one too. That mass. That one too. Actually, no. There was another one with a Middle Eastern guy that that like n nobody would have made that a few years ago, right? Like, um, there's so much more stuff getting made that's you know blowing up because of the shift. That's actually easier than you'd think. Um, all right. So the thing I love most, and COVID honestly helped this. Um, I. I swore a few years ago that I wasn't going to go work for anybody again, because every time I went somewhere and built out a slate, either some new guy came over and fired everybody at the company and you lose all those projects or, you know, for a million other reasons, which I probably shouldn't say, like something would happen and a company would implode and I would lose all those projects. Right. Um, that's happened a lot. And I never want to do that again. I, w I wanted it to be kind of in my own hands. So, the thing I love now, and again, COVID's helped with this, is that I have my own hours. I, I've been, I'm mostly doing my meetings around the house, although sometimes I'll drive for something. Um, I get to spend more time with my kids, and I'm developing a lot of stuff. And because you can do it now on Zoom, and because like all these different, like I love still being able to do this. And I, I actually get a lot more done sitting here than I do traveling to an office or whatever. And I love being my own boss and developing the things I want to develop. And at least having the knowledge of what I think can work and sell that I love. The thing that I hate is back to that finding actors for things. The things I'm developing right now, the six things that we're casting, all of them would have gotten made 10 years ago. All of them like easy, easy, easy would have gotten made. Now it's so hard um, to get things up and running and everybody's having this problem. I mean, I heard I was talking to, Somebody the other day that was talking about this other producer that has like a Stephen King thing and like the big high level things and still can't get cast, you know, like it's that hard. And I hate that about it, but it's, it's OK. I think it's going to even itself out soon.